So today we're speaking about collective liberation, navigating the path to mental health activism and autonomy. In the words of, uh, of, of a great activist um, and a mentor to me, Darby Penny, uh, this is an, an admittedly uh, biased take because it does come from my life experience. So I just wanted to ground us in this quote, love has never been a popular movement and no one's ever really wanted to be free. This world is held together. It really is held together by few, by the, by the love and passion of few people. And this quote is by James Baldwin, excellent author and activist. And I think, uh, you know, in this quote, he, he proceeds to say, you can become the monster. You can become the cop. You can become these things. And I think when we talk about mental health activism today and we talk about disability justice and these movements um, and how so much of our work is in uh, carceral systems, punitive systems of incarceration, if you will, uh, we very much do need to have that take of one, when we uh, move together, it is out of love. Two, when we move together out of love, it is for liberation. And what that liberation has looked like has looked like many things for many different people. So for, I'm going to use uh, the some of the wisdom that I had gained from, from, from another mentor, Sally Zinman, which was the idea of peer-run drop-in centers and self-help spaces and all of these other spaces that, um, that many of us with life experience work in to liberate our people. Those spaces initially were intended to liberate our minds and bodies from the mental health system, from the ideas that we were taught in the mental health system. And those ideas are ideas of shame and pain, and we need to have a solidarity in that. So in that vein, I'm going to get into some of my own life experience. So I'm a mixed race uh, indigenous person uh, of, the, of the ancestral lands known as the Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico. Um, we like to call them Quisquea and Boriquen. Um, those, those are the original names of those lands. And uh, recently in my life, I've become involved with the United Confederation of Taino People. I have met with a lot of the elders in my community, and I have come back to my ancestral lands and those initial teachings. But the way that I was brought up as, um, as someone who was raised in this country by my mother, who you can see in the top photo here to the right, um, she immigrated to this country before I was born, uh, worked as a PCA, personal care assistant, she, she had to work 10 to 13 hour days. And um, I was in the public school system. I grew up in uh, section eight housing in, in, in central Massachusetts. Uh, and, and the visual of the apartment that I grew up in was that of an apartment with a metal door that had dents from bullets in it, from the door being shot in the past. When you would look at the hallways and the various structures of those buildings. You had very bland brick buildings. You had uh, those green, those light green painted hallways and stairs. So environments that don't really inspire that you care about human beings. In a lot of ways, when we are in these environments, we grow up in systems in a way. So for me, growing up in this neighborhood, I saw a lot of Black, Hispanic, Vietnamese kids who were my friends grow up and not trust the United States government, grow up and not trust the systems we've come to know, to know today and the society that we know today. And the reason why was because 
they understood that that system never served them and, was, and wasn't designed with them in mind. So at a very young age, I would go with my mother to the Dominican Republic and uh, spend months at a time on our ancestral land. Uh, she grew up in Ihue, Dominican Republic. And when we would go to those lands, it was such a stark contrast from where I grew up, which is what I was just describing to you, those brick structures, those bland spaces, but instead had trees such as palm trees and an avocado tree in, in, my, in my grandmother's backyard that I would climb. But something else that I noticed about Ihue was that it had dirt roads. It had above ground sewers at the time. Currently, there's an underground sewage system. And that there were tourists, white tourists that would ride in large safari buses and drive through our neighborhood. And for me, this was a very early glimpse in, in yeah, I'm different, but why, why are we different? Why are we treated differently? Why are our ancestral lands um, hurt in such a way? And when we talk about love in action and waging love as a movement, if you will, I think the reason why that has never been popular is because under the guise of white supremacy and American capitalism, we don't see ourselves in each other. Uh, just yesterday, I was, I, I was talking to, to, to someone here about the South African concept of Ubuntu. And uh, the idea of Ubuntu is that we are in essence made up of others because of what we learn, what we carry, and how we move through this life. And for me, I think at the center of that is ancestral wisdom, particularly that ancestral wisdom for me, my ancestors uh, were, were referred to as caciques. A lot of them were, were caciques, at least leaders in our community. And what the word cacique means in Taino is chief. So if you think of a chief of a Native American tribe that you would see today, a cacique for us is a chief. And the chiefs today that I know are, are Roberto Borrero and, 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 and many others, but the ones that were our ancestors, like Ana Caona, uh, she was a woman fighting for liberation against the Spanish, you know, um, and then later the, the, the Spanish and the French brought ideas of patriarchy and colonization and colonialism with them onto the lands. So for me, a, a, a central part of my healing journey and a, some, a central part of my liberation was liberating myself from Western medicine which I see as pretty much inseparable from these struggles. And I think something that, that we see even today is, is so many people who have a diasporic longing. Now, a diasporic longing is a longing for a connection to where you are from, the land you are from, the land where your people are from. And for us, whether if you are black, brown, or a white person, as we refer to um, in this Western context, you are someone who has ancestral lands of somewhere. You are someone with ancestors that you can call on. You are someone with that inherent connection. And I think often we run on this hedonic treadmill, if you will, of continuing to produce the new thing, continuing to create, continuing to contribute to the world, often for the ideas of collective liberation, I'm sure for, for many of us in this room. What we miss um, in, in, those, in those struggles for, for, for collective liberation is each other. 
And what I mean by that is, is that, is that often we're not seeing the, the struggle in each other. We're focusing on, on how we have to build within this mission, within this broader mission, but we're not working on change one person at a time. I think for, for many of us, in a way, when, when, when we work for change one person at a time, it's the people we support, it's the people that we talk to, it's listening in those moments. It's taking the time to be present and understand that change doesn't happen on some national level in the way that capitalist systems lead us to believe which is basically taking this macro view where we have to work on this policy, this issue, these pieces, but rather change has to happen socially. There has to be a paradigm shift in, in how we think about things. And today I want to talk about what that paradigm shift looked like for me. So here you can see images of protests that I've attended and protests that I've helped organize over the years. And it took a, a long time before I actually started fighting for struggles for liberation. The grounding of where I started was as someone who was like, okay, well, I've been hospitalized on and off for four and a half years. I am coming back into community spaces and I want to figure out how to give back to people like myself. At the time, I was very much identifying as someone who was mentally ill. And then later, I would reject this concept. And the reason why I would reject this concept for myself was because I would realize that the term mentally ill would be used to label people like myself as violent as dangerous, as unreasonable, as a lot of things. But during this time, I sought out support in the communities in Massachusetts that I was a part of. At first, I was a part of um, an LGBT community called Safe Homes. And during that, that time, I was trying to really understand my own queerness. And then after that period of time, I was like, okay, so... So I have some community around this. Um, I have some solidarity around this. This is good to see. But I didn't feel welcomed in those spaces fully because of mental health discrimination, because of sanism, because of ableism. I didn't feel fully welcomed in those spaces because of racism, because of a, a, wide, a wide variety of things. So for me, a struggle for collective liberation at its very roots um, is inherent to my life struggle. I think when we talk about intergenerational trauma and experiences of intergenerational trauma, we often think of it as something that is passed down. But intergenerational trauma isn't simply passed down. It, it also goes up. It goes in every direction. And the reason why it does is because we are all human beings understanding and seeing the world through each other. So often we push to perceive things in binaries. We push to put things in like a diagnostic manual, like the DSM. We push to seek to understand human experience and pathologize it. When originally thinking about the word psychosis, the word psyche representing uh, um, mind, body, and soul, and then osis representing abnormal state. And when we think about how that word psychosis has been weaponized against many of us, uh, it can be challenging to, to understand why someone would, would want to claim or identify with that experience. That's why there's been many different movements that have moved away from, from that and have, and have really centered the human experience, such as hearing voices, seeing visions, altered states, extreme states. Something that's so important, though, is, is that if we were to take uh, social ideas of psychosis, 
and understands that uh, people have the right to reclaim that experience, regardless of what it looks like for them, and understand historically how it has been weaponized against our community. We can gain more solidarity and momentum in the movements for liberation. Something that was a key shift for me uh, when becoming a part of mental health peer run communities in Massachusetts, um, such as the recovery learning communities, was that that social approach was really key to liberating my mind from these perceived ideas that I have of myself. I could start talking about suicide and the experience of hearing voices and seeing visions at peer support groups. I was like, wait, really? You're not going to call the police on me? I was like, wait, really? I can just talk about these things? And those, those experiences were really freeing in themselves. And I think, I think something that is so, so, so important about that is when talking about ancestral healing and talking about indigenous wisdom and talking about all of these experiences that that many of my ancestors had and that many of my ancestors didn't have was that we would share wisdom with each other. I think a key example of this is the Degara tribe in South Africa. And the Degara tribe in South Africa knows that when someone starts hearing voices or seeing visions, that, that those are signs for gifts that haven't been fully tapped into yet. And then an elder in that community meets with that young adult, with that person that's experiencing that emerging spiritual state and sits with them through it and shares their experience and how they fostered that gift and how they worked through that gift. It is vastly different from the Western medical model we know today. For my people, the Taino, um, when we would have what some of us in, in the West call altered states, we would engage in ceremonies called arietos, where we would gather in large circles in celebration and commune together spiritually. Meaning we would be in that moment, in that state, and we would dance and celebrate how we are feeling. And then we would come together and convene and talk about what these altered states taught us. But when we weaponize altered states, when we weaponize these things, we must have liberation movements and struggles against how it is being weaponized. So here in these photos, as you can see, that's a photo of me next to the poster, Bet Your Ass We're Mad. <laughs> and uh, the, the reason why it says that, uh, and, and, and the reason why um, I, I had, that, had that poster was that I was going to a Mad Pride event in uh, Vermont. Uh, there's, a, there's a Mad Pride Vermont, uh, event in Vermont every year. And we were protesting the Brattleboro Retreat, um, which is a psych institution that uh, was involuntarily committing people and still continues to um, and, and, and harm people. And this, this poster is actually from, a, from very early on in the psychiatric survivor and anti-psychiatry movement. There, there was a poster that said, bet your ass, we're paranoid. So I switched it to bet your ass, we're mad. And uh, just below the, uh, and, and, and next to it, the, these are more recent. Um, but but I also want to reflect on on other moments. Uh, getting involved early in activism in Massachusetts for me was protesting against the Judge Rottenberg Center, which uses uh, electroshock devices um, on the surface of people's skin, uh, particularly autistic young adults um, and youth. And uh, the Judge Rottenberg Center has had reports written by the United Nations um, in opposition to what they have done to people and what they continue to do. Um, and after COVID, they were able to uh, continue to use these shock devices for prolonged periods of time. And we've continued to organize against it um, as a stop the shock coalition. 
And today, we see the rise of involuntary commitment throughout the country, particularly policies that are uh, geared towards targeting unhoused people, houseless people, um, and targeting many of us uh, who are mad, labeled mentally ill, or neurodivergent. And I think that there's an important struggle here where, where we're not seeing the solidarity that we need to have um, and the organizing that we need to have between housing justice spaces, disability justice spaces, and, um, and other spaces. And, that, and that, that organizing is central. Particularly one example that, that I want to name um, in terms of involuntary commitment and what is happening right now is care courts in California. And the reason why I want to name this model is uh, it's, it's particularly the insidious nature of how people are potentially going to be labeled and are starting to be labeled as gravely disabled. Gravely disabled. This, this bill, um, I believe it was re originally referred to as SB 43, um, and that labeling of gravely disabled applies to individuals who use substances, applies to individuals who, who may or may not have a mental health diagnosis, and literally targets populations for their removal from the streets. And then similarly, you see Mayor Eric Adams' mental health directive, which is also targeting people in the subways and on the streets by having police go through and remove people and get them into treatment. So we're seeing this narrative of access to mental health treatment, but we're not asking what that access looks like, what that access means. The, the, these questions are essential, and I think that, that that popular narrative of access to mental health treatment is something that we see that's, that's a challenge in both the disability rights movement, in movements for prison abolition and prison reform. It's a struggle that we see in, in movements for Black liberation and Brown liberation. It's, it's struggles that we see in, in queer liberation movements. People believe that in order to reduce the amount of people who are incarcerated in United States prisons today, keeping in mind that the United States has the most incarcerated people in the world, that, that they need to be in mental health treatment. But a lot of folks aren't asking the question of what that treatment looks like and how it's going to impact people's lives. And then this protest that you see further up in the corner is a protest asking for justice for Jordan Neely, who was a young black man, Michael Jackson impersonator in New York City, um, who was restrained to the point of death by an ex-Marine on a New York City subway. And... I think something that is that that is so striking, uh, particularly about protesting for, for for justice for Jordan Neely and the rise for 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 justice at that time was that people were starting to listen to to, to carceral sanism a little bit more. But the struggle is is that as long as we are perceived as both dangerous and unable, as long as we are perceived as both violent and as deficit in our society and as disposable, we will continue to have struggles for liberation, particularly for uh, Black and Brown folks who may or may not have a mental health diagnosis. We're going to continue to have these struggles for liberation because at the very center of that, we need to recognize the histories of oppression that have taken place. Months before uh, the murder of Jordan Neely, there was uh, another individual named Irvo Otieno, who was in a Virginia state hospital. And he was restrained to death 
behind the doors of a psychiatric institution. It had some news coverage, but not as much. And arguably, one of the reasons is, is that when something happens behind the doors of a psychiatric institution, just like it would behind the closed doors of any institution, it would not be covered because the narrative is controlled by the carceral system that controls that space. And I think uh, when, when we talk about this, what we're really trying to get to is the fact that some of these ideas that psychosis is not a moral failing. You may have heard of this before, but I want to unpack what that actually means for a moment. When we say psychosis is not a moral failing, we're trying to say that the people that you perceive as having psychosis, the people that you label with psychosis are not moral failures in our society. And that the very idea of moral failure and the very ideas of morality are not designed for many of us. Because similarly in, in the experiences that I was sharing earlier in my childhood, many, many friends in my neighborhood and many family members um, engaged in criminal activities where they sold drugs, where they stole from, from other neighborhoods, where they did all of these things. And the reason why um, was out of that distrust for the system. When the system is rigged against you, you will do whatever you need to do to survive because you understood that it never was truly for you. And I think in that same vein, when we view what is, you know, um, moral in our society, who is deciding what is moral? Is it decided by white men in our society? Yes, the answer is yes. And is our existence immoral? Is our existence mad? Is our existence queer? I think uh, one, one statement that's always really resonated with me was a statement from the early queer liberation movement, which is be gay, do crime. And that, 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 that statement was actually an anti-capitalist statement. And what it meant was to be gay in society is criminal in the very first place. And I think that that's, that's just as important for me as a brown person to, and an indigenous person to exist in society is to be criminal. I often share um, the, and I, and I shared a little bit of it yesterday, but when we think about the, the way in which natives here on Turtle Island have been treated for hundreds of years, we see uh, people who, who have been assimilated and removed from their customs as a result of genocide. And I think something that, that is so important is to recognize how the psychiatric system historically has been used as a tool to incarcerate, to remove people from their lands or to remove them from the very rights that they are fighting for. A good example of this is the Detroit riots where a lot of folks who were fighting for liberation were then incarcerated in a psychiatric institution and then their psychiatric notes read that they had schizophrenia that their, their symptoms of schizophrenia were associated with their involvement with the civil rights movement, with civil unrest. And as I mentioned yesterday, the, uh, the Hiawatha Asylum for Insane Indians incarcerating 300 natives on the basis of a diagnosis such as horse stealing mania. So when we look at these, the, these carceral histories, it's hard to not see them today. Um, in the ways in which we perceive psychosis, in the, in the ways in which we perceive unhoused people, in the ways in which we perceive the public. When I'm talking about collective liberation, I'm saying that all of our, all of our efforts 
the ways in which we want to move and be free are bound up together. That, that quote actually comes from an Aboriginal group in, um, in New Zealand, uh, the, the Maori. And I think when, when we talk about being bound together and moving together, it's understanding that when we talk about experiences that relate to psychosis, that no one is exempt from it. The way in which we think of the, the, the public and people as, as violence or that we label them in this way, it, it has something to do with every liberation movement. And then when we talk about bodily autonomy, that is a common struggle within every movement, within every space. I think um, something that we see in the psychiatric survivor movement is we are talking more and more about disability justice now. But for many years, we moved away from the idea of disability because disability is often conflated with deficit. When in fact, there's a social model of disability that says it's not an inherent deficit on your body mind or your mind and body. There's nothing wrong with your mind and body as you are, but rather spaces and society need to be accessible to you. As soon as I understood this, and I looked back at some of my experiences with hearing voices and seeing visions, being labeled as schizoaffective as a young adult, having some of these, these experiences, I realized, wow, okay, maybe that was disabling. Maybe, I, maybe there is a liberation struggle right there that I'm not recognizing, that I'm not opening my eyes to. And it wasn't until years later where I, de where, where I developed tachycardia and I experienced Bell's palsy, where half of my face was in paralysis for a short period of time, where I started to see the way in which stress was disabling and harming my body the way in which I was internalizing and taking stress with me. Which is why I think community care is so essential to our liberation because we will not live long if we don't take care of each other. In order for us to be liberated and move together, we must recognize that these movements are intrinsically tied together. And at the foundation of this, when we think of um, storytelling and sharing our life experiences, these are indigenous practices, the way in which we engage and move through these spaces. And you don't necessarily have to identify as an indigenous person or relate to those experiences, even though I would argue that your ancestors, your, your, your lineages are indigenous of somewhere. We think of ourselves as apart from nature. We don't recognize that we are a part of nature. We are nature. These ideas are so essential when, when we talk about a decolonial struggle, struggles for, for decolonization. And, um, and with that, it's so important to recognize that those movements for, for, for love and peace and action they have to be centered in those ideas of community care and collective liberation. So for me, I touched a little bit on personal liberation earlier, but what I want to say as well is, is, that, is that I think today in the mental health system and in many different systems that are affected by the mental health system, we continue to see this, this, this struggle where particularly folks like myself who are labeled as schizoaffective and who, who, who are um, black and brown, we're, we're being labeled at such a, such a stark and alarming rate. We're actually five times more likely to be labeled than, than, than white folk with schizophrenia. And why is that? It's, it's a presumption of criminality. 
it's racism, it's, it, it's a wide variety of things. But for me, in my own personal struggle, I've, I've realized that the ways in which I was labeled, the way in which I had police involvement in some of my situations of distress, the way in which I was kept in the hospital longer because I didn't want to accept things like electroconvulsive therapy. I didn't want to accept the, the ways in which I was coerced to be separated from my conscious mind and body. This personal liberation and this realization for a struggle of personal liberation profoundly impacted me. I was labeled non-compliant uh, when I was in the state hospital, spent about a year in the state hospital, uh, Worcester State Hospital particularly. And years later, I came back to uh, work in Worcester State Hospital on behalf of a peer-run community um, as a peer bridger. And it was interesting because when I came back into the space, a lot of the hospital staff were like, really? They let you in here? Oh, uh, and, and, and continuing to see the, the, the struggle for, for, for liberation and the ways in which the modern institution, um, the modern psychiatric facility, uh, the, the, the deeply, deeply, deeply alarming and painful way in which the modernization of these institutions, um, is, is being presented as the humane alternative is at the center of this impact um, and this struggle for liberation. So to, to propose a few different solutions and to move ourselves towards collective liberation, I want to invite the idea that these struggles are so, so, so present in your everyday life, whether or not if you identify as someone with life experience, with psychiatric incarceration, whether if you identify as a mad person or a neurodivergent person, or if you identify as someone who is mentally ill or with a mental illness, whether if you identify as a person with psychosis or otherwise, these, the, these liberations, once again, are bound together. So in, in order for us to move together, we have to start to engage in the idea that multiple things can be true at the same time. We have to hold those multiple truths and we have to engage with other movements. Particularly, I recommend engaging with housing justice movements right now, reproductive justice movements right now, uh, movements for queer liberation and black and brown liberation. And the reason why I think we, we miss the commonality is because we think about mad and disabled people as other. We think about them as, as I said earlier, both dangerous and unable. Um, and we internalize these ideas. We internalize these ideas in, in a wide variety of ways. So in, in order to move for liberation, we have to realize that the reservoirs of hope, um, as Angela Davis would put it, lie in each other. The reservoirs of hope for moving towards collective liberation, we must see in each other. And we must realize that regardless of who you are in this world, we share a common struggle. Thank you. Hey, um, we're going to take some questions now. And for our volunteer here, let's do a couple of questions. We have them in person. And then to do virtual questions, you'd move to the, the AV table at the back and we can bring those up on the screen. Sound good? Okay. Wow. Vesper, thank you so much for an amazing talk. Um, you hit on so many things that are important to me. We have a lot of shared history. Um, so thank you. Your honesty, authenticity was very moving. Thank you. 
Who has some questions for Vesper? I see uh, Jessica there. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I, I think, you know, I, I've been working in an emergency room in the, in the Bronx for the last three and a half years. And we, there's definitely a huge conflation between violence and mental illness, so what they call psych schizophrenic. Whenever anybody does anything aggressive or outside the norm, they're, they're, they're labeled schizophrenic. And there's a, also a lot of people under arrest. Um, I often look at them and say, this, this person is not, there's no psychosis. This person's not crazy, let's say, for lack of a better word, right? Then they go into the criminal justice system. <laughs> there, there, there seems to be these two choices. Either you go in the hospital or, or you go in, and you're through the criminal justice system. And, and I think part of it, and um, <clears throat> especially, you know, with the whole Mayor Adams thing, Majig, that he's trying to do is that when you, when the basis of policy is really about <clears throat> othering and separating people from the rest of, of, of society, that, that whole, Mayor Adams did not say, oh, gee, you know, there's a lot of suffering out there, there these homeless people. You know, it was, no, this is disrupting everybody else's quality of life. We need to remove these people so we don't have to deal with this. Um, and, you know, all of the policies have to do with putting people somewhere else that are disrupting society. Um, and I, I think that's that's the commonality. And as long as the policy is based on, you know, secluding, confining and putting in some sort of institution, it's, it's not really going to get it anywhere. But I think what we're really not dealing with is there's a lot of rage in society right now. There's a lot. We're very angry here. Um, and a, a lot of there's been a record number of violence in the hospital where I work in. It's, you know, been explosive violence. Um, and, and I think people are angry and we don't really have a, we're not really addressing why so many people are angry. Um, so, again, they become criminals or they become mentally ill and that's it. And I think until we address some of the issues of our collective rage, people are some people are angry about gay people existing, some people are, are you know, angry about the carceral system, all of different things, but there's a lot of rage right now. And I, I think in not dealing with it, we, we end up um, just sort of finding a way to put other, other people on the left and, and the right. Um, so I don't really have a question, just a comment and thanks for your work. I do have a response. And I think the, the response I wanna ground in in another statement, which is the idea that prisons disappear people. Um, that's, an, that's another statement by Angela Davis and um, that psychiatric institutions in that same vein do disappear people. And a big, a big part of that is what you were starting to talk about, which is this idea of discrimination against people on the basis of how they are how are they are distressed by society and what is happening and i don't think that we acknowledge it as discrimination enough there are many people who who still follow campaigns around mental health stigma and the stigma puts the onus on the person not systems or society to do better we're not acknowledging carceral sanism the nature of being incarcerated on the basis of being thought of as dangerous, you know? And I think we need to name that. We need to have more public education campaigns to shift the paradigm and the knowledge that we see in the public. Um, the more we do that, the more we will find people who are more allied and in solidarity with our struggle. And one more question from the in-person audience. Um, yeah, Michael. Um, can we bring... I, I've got the, the mic. Oh, sorry. sorry. I, didn't, I didn't see you um, had it already, Marty. Lovely talk. Um, at the risk of being extremely politically incorrect, I identify as a person. Early in my career, I identified as a psychologist and uh, this and that. And the more comfortable, more aware I became of myself, and I don't mean self in the superficial way, self more as connected to soul, the less I needed to identify as anything other than a human being and a person. Um, the stronger my identity um, 
the more I felt at conflict with anything and everything. Um, I'm just going to leave that aside. Um, as somebody that spent a career working in a state hospital in a prison, um, I would encourage yourself, and I'm most most of what you say is true. There's a, there, there there's stereotypes, and there's reasons why there's stereotypes because it's more often than not true. But I've done an awful lot of good work for an awful lot of people over a very long time in those institutions, and I think it's um, to just assume that it's all bad in those places is doing those places and the people that want to do good in those places of a disservice. Um, I could take you some places and you would be shocked at the compassion in some of these prisons in, in California is where I worked. And believe me, I know the horror stories. I've watched some of those things happen myself. And I think it's too easy to assume that they're all bad. You know, just like people aren't all bad, institutions aren't all bad. And I think when we look at for the potential and not just condemn them for uh, the limitations that the collective culture that evolves in those places create, um, potential starts to happen. You know, when you care about human beings in, in, a, in a place like a prison or a state hospital, at first you're frowned upon, to say the least, as an employee. But over time, people get it that, wow, maybe that's the right thing to do. And it starts to rub off. So I, I encourage all of us not to just assume that those are evil places. Bad things happen there. There's no question about that. We all know that. But some of the most compassionate things, experiences I've had in my life have happened inside those walls. And just please remember that. Thank you. I want to acknowledge and validate that. I mean, I've known a lot of people in my life who said, who have said, I wouldn't have been sober if I didn't stay in this institution. My kid wouldn't be alive. I wouldn't be alive. But I, what I'm trying to refer to is like urging us as a society to reconsider that the very instance of removal of people in the first place the very instance of segregation and the rights, uh, the, the civil rights and disability rights that have been gained over the years. I and mean, when you look at the Olmstead decision um, and Lois Curtis's struggle for, for, for liberation, the idea was that we would live desegregated as a society. And when you see state institutions, when you see prisons, they're very, very, very much segregated from the rest of society. I'm not proposing a solution for, for, for integration. I think it takes a long time to, to dismantle some of these institutions, but we should work towards building the conditions where they would no longer exist. As, as long as we continue to, to, to fight for them to simply exist and be like, well, you know, there's, there's some compassion work. Uh, compassionate work there. It's like, it's not saying that there isn't. It's just, what does that compassionate work look like when the very uh, systems and the histories of those institutions are insidious? You know, when the histories remain unacknowledged, when these institutions continue. A good example of this is, um, is there is a state institution in, 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 in Texas that is still active today. And it is it, it was an institution that that segregated uh, blacks and whites in the same institutional space. And the way in which they treated black patients who were actually referred to as inmates in this in, in this space, they were beaten with rubber hoses, they were starved, they did not have access. To, to food or water at the same rate that, that white patients do. When you see the modern manifestation of that, the modern manifestation of that is, is that at an alarming rate, black and brown people are being diagnosed with oppositional defiance disorder. We're being labeled as schizoaffective and schizophrenic. We are being put on forensic units. And when we are in those prison systems, even in terms of mental health treatment, 
or, 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 or care, if you could even refer to it as care in those moments. What is happening to us is the fact that we are more likely to be restrained. We are more likely to die as a result of those restraints because we are perceived as violent inherently. And that is at the very roots of that system. It is, it, it is, it is inseparable. So that's why we continue to reform and modernize institution and, and we always have new sets of issues as a result of that. So I just, I, I just wanted to name that. Thank you, Vesper. Do we have any uh, questions from the virtual audience? We do. So there's a great conversation happening in the online chat about the utility of anger and rage. And the question is, do you feel the anger issue in the U.S. is unique? And what is anger good for? Yeah. Anger is good for a lot of things. Um, I think anger is is good in the way where we can find mutuality in our suffering and in our struggle. I think it's it, it, it's important to acknowledge anger in that regard. I do think simultaneously anger can be really divisive and it can be manipulated politically and it can separate groups. And it can also put groups in solidarity and work towards collective liberation. Anger is an emotion. Uh, emotions flow through us, and we should honor each of those emotions. But yeah, I I would say there's there's a lot of just anger happening right now, and I think I think something else to acknowledge is is that we've been through so much in just these few years. I mean, even when we look at the last the last decade or more in the United States, it was with a guise in the background of a war in, in Iraq. It was with a guise in the background of so many things happening that go unacknowledged because we are running on this he hedonic treadmill of continuing to produce, continuing to do at the pace of capitalism. We believe that our value and what we produce is related to that. So we're like, I can't acknowledge those feelings or those emotions. I have to keep going. And what happens when, when, when those emotions go unacknowledged and the people go unlistened? Anger manifests. Was there any other questions from the online audience? That's the only question okay. online. All right. Well, we had, I already called on Michael and didn't give an opportunity. So let's have Michael and then Lily, I saw your hand up. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, it helped me to understand, I think, more deeply your experience and, you know, folks like you. Uh, as a psychiatrist who's worked in public psychiatry for my entire career, uh, I think I have a more Trojan horse strategy about what to do about this. So I think it's certainly true that a lot of what passes as um, biological illness is actually suffering that's induced by conditions of society. So I, I accept that. I think that's true. And I wanted to bring to everyone's attention uh, some early, maybe positive developments in psychiatry. There was a um, very interesting paper in a journal called Molecular Psychiatry, which gives you a sense of what's published in the journal. Three very senior uh, uh, psychiatrists published a paper that uh, most of the research about a biological basis for what's called schizophrenia uh, is quite suspect because none of it uh, or very little of it controls for trauma. And uh, the, the idea is that all the investigations for changes in the brain that are used to justify uh, these conditions as being medical illnesses, uh, as they put it, there's a hidden confound. That's as strongly as they could put it in all of the research. So all of that has to be redone. Uh, and 
So there, there are some psychiatrists who are interested in that. There are some psychiatrists who actually have come to an understanding that the biological model is bankrupt. It's not, uh, it's not really producing a positive uh, result. Now, another thing that I think most psychiatrists accept, I, I'm already talking too long, oh, sorry. <clears throat> another thing that most psychiatrists accept is that uh, trauma within the family uh, increases the risk of psychosis. So uh, sexual abuse, physical abuse, neglect, these kinds of things. Uh, th there's a very solid literature about this and, and only uh, somebody who is uh, determined not to see the truth is gonna resist this. So very substantial. And I think a thing that isn't hooked onto that yet, which I think many in this uh, group could do is that it's not just trauma within a family you know, where uh, parents are raping their children and this sorts of stuff. But it's the trauma that society does uh, in not letting people have uh, conditions, you know, in which they can, uh, they can live. And <clears throat> uh, that fits naturally, I think, with the overall model of the importance of trauma. Uh, and one of two things is going to happen, I think, is that in psychiatry, uh, the voice of an interest in trauma will grow larger and larger and larger, and that will become the vision, or uh, the pharmaceutical industry and the leaders of psychiatry to protect their positions of power, they will find a way to co-opt this discovery that <laughs> trauma is involved. When I try to do practical things, uh, and uh, so I'm working with one of the psychiatric residents in my program, we're reviewing a uh, hundred most cited articles in biological psychiatry about the diagnosis of schizophrenia. And the point of the paper is to see how many of them controlled for trauma. Uh, and uh, I don't know what we're gonna find yet, but I, I, I think uh, uh, any, uh, probably none, have controlled effectively for trauma. So I'm, I'm saying that as a psychiatrist, uh, I, I don't see myself as killing people's souls. <clears throat> I'm working within the institution of psychiatry, and I think I have, uh, uh, not everybody can do that, you know, because I have the title and credentials and blah, 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 but uh, can do something from within the Trojan horse to steer things in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Yeah, yeah, I could do just a quick applause. And, and I, and I want to respond that I believe your Trojan horse strategy should continue. Uh, I, I, I don't know if, if, if I gave the impression of, 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 of not wanting to have that Trojan horse strategy, but what, what I'm trying to say is that both need to exist simultaneously. We have to fight for a society that can eventually not exist in the way and, and, and being policed in these ways, right? Uh, where 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 the existence of that policing is is, is removed. That's that's the ideal. That's that's the goal, uh, kind of across liberation movements. Uh, but but to to what you are saying, I I think historically. Um, in the psychiatric survivor movement and the disability rights movement, we've seen radical psychiatrists, we've seen radical therapists start to write about their, their workings, their ideas about how they can reframe a lot of these things. In the United Kingdom, we've seen the power, um, threat, and meaning framework. We've seen different frameworks that have, you know, gone for these liberatory strategies. We've seen a growth in, in, in trauma-informed approaches in the past. We've seen so many things that have erupted over these years. And I think even with the mission of eventually living in a society that doesn't have carceral institutions, we will still need, you know, um, psychiatrists who will be knowledgeable in the way of how these medications work, how to support people to either stay on them if they're choosing that or come off of them if they choose that. We will still need to continue to have this in our community. There's a, there, there, there's not going to be a future that necessarily doesn't have that. And the reason why I say that is because there are many people who define 
these weaponized plant medicines as both life-saving and destroying, right, simultaneously. That's a statement from, from Project Let's. Um, the idea that, that psychiatric medication, psychiatric drugs can be both life-saving and destroying simultaneously, and we have to contend with that as a society. So I think there is a role for, for, for psychiatrists and professionals continuing in this vision. It just has to be centered in a place of community care. Are the psychiatrists from that community? Are they supporting the people in that in, in that neighborhood? Are families and gas station attendants and barbers and people who work at salons and community centers truly having the the tools and approaches they need to approach in a way that centers community care for individuals that are experiencing distress? That wisdom needs to be shared inside of communities. So yes, I I, I wanted to just say. I appreciate the work you're doing and please continue because we need it. Am I still? Well, I'm, folks, I know this is such a great talk, but that is all we're going to have time for. I'm sorry, Lily. Maybe we can have a conversation over coffee. Vesper, I just want to say thank you again, especially for responding to these questions with, with love and compassion. Um, even you know, being challenged, we we are all on the same pathway to shared liberation. I want us to to remember that. Um, so please give it up for Vesper. Thank you. Oh, standing ovation in the room. If you're at home on your computers, you can give a standing ovation at home too.